Okay, we now have uh, the uh, privilege of listening to uh, Summer Gentry as the uh, as an alumni speaker. Um, Summer was a, a DOE CSGF uh, fellow from 2001 to 2005. She received a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT, an MS in operations research, and a BS in mathematical and computational science at Stanford. She's currently associate professor of mathematics at the U.S. Naval Academy and faculty member at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Her work on uh, that she's going to talk about, uh, title's not up there yet, having to do with matching, uh, finding donors to match um, organs that needed to be transplanted, has been featured in a number of major media outlets such as Time, Reader's Digest, Science, the Discovery Channel, and uh, National Public Radio. So please help me welcome Summer. Thank you so much for that. This is really exciting for me to be able to address this group after having received so much support from the CSGF program early in my career. And I mean really the support, not just the funding for my graduate education, but the community of the people that are in this room. So that's what I want to tell you about this program review is for all of you who are fellows or, and all of the alums are also getting together at this meeting. The greatest part about this program is the synergy from bringing together people who cut across departments and, um, and communities within academia and come together because we all care about using computation to solve some of the most important problems that we have. And the problem that I'm going to talk about solving today is the problem of the need to ration organs for transplantation. So people tend to get really exercised about the idea of rationing health care, that there should be always enough health care dollars available to do everything that we know how to do to save every single person's life. And even though that's not true, it's really not true in transplantation because it's not just dollars, it's actually these precious, healthy human organs for transplantation that we don't have nearly enough of um, for everyone who needs one. And so policy making in transplantation is really fraught because of these trade-offs between different candidates, both of whom would be able to benefit from an organ. And so that means that the kinds of models that I build have to be very transparent, understandable to the policymakers, and they also have to align with what the policymakers you know, see as their objectives. And so I'll tell you about a couple of different problems that I've worked on in this area. Um, I got into this field, actually, because my husband is a transplant surgeon. And he is at Johns Hopkins. He brought to me the very first problem in optimization and transplant that I've worked on. Um, but first, I'll talk about a little bit about this. This is a liver ready to be transplanted. It's a very precious object. We transplant about 6,000 of them every year, and there are 17,000 people on the waiting list for them. The challenge is to get them to the people who need them the most. The prioritization scheme for liver transplants is sickest first. The, there's a MELD score, Modeled End Stage Liver Disease Score, that says, how likely are you to die in the next 90 days if you don't get a transplant? And the higher that likelihood is, the higher you're prioritized for a transplant. So actually, this, this talk starts with an email that my husband got, very much like emails that he gets frequently. And this was from a friend, a friend of a friend of a friend who lived in Southern California and said, I'm waiting for a liver transplant. I've been on the list for a long time, and my, my loved one, my partner, can't donate to me, but wanted to, and I'm, I'm about to run out of time, really, to wait. And so my husband's considered medical advice was move. Move to Florida. And so this patient picked up all of his, packed up all of his belongings, moved to Florida, got his transplant within two months, and moved home and is now healthy and happy uh, living his life. And his insurance company paid for him to move. So why did that happen? Well, it happened because there's a huge geographic imbalance in the supply of livers and the need for them across the country. So these are the 58 donation service areas. And right now, livers essentially go to the, I said they go to the sickest first. 
Well, they don't go to the sickest person first. They go to the sickest person in your donation service area first. And it just so happens, well, these lines weren't designed in any particular way other than based on historical relationships between transplant centers. So it turns out that some of these DSAs have a lot more supply and a lot less demand. Um, it turns out that liver disease is very geographically concentrated. It um, tends to be ethnically linked. Also, donation is very geographically concentrated because it has to do with demographics, where older people live versus younger people, also how people die, um, motor vehicle accidents, seatbelt laws, a whole lot of things play into the fact that in different places you can have somewhat, something like four t a fourfold difference in the number of available donors, and something like a 20-fold difference in the number of people who, who need a transplant across the country. Okay, so this has been a problem for a really long time. It's an extremely severe problem. What you're seeing here is for people, this is how sick you are. These are the sickest people. They need a transplant the most. If you look at one of these high MELD scores, like 38, in some places, you have an 18% chance of getting transplanted in the next 90 days, and in some places, you have an 86% chance of getting transplanted in the next 90 days. If you win the zip code lottery, you're pretty happy about this situation, but the fact is that the alternative to getting a transplant is really dying for people that are that sick, and so the chance of dying in the next 90 days is 14% if you are in a good zip code, and. 82% if you're in a bad zip code, and this is really untenable. It turns out that also, the, this is not just the geographic disparity, it's also a socioeconomic disparity because only people who are savvy and have the resources to move and have certain kinds of insurance are able to chase the organ supply in this way. And also geographic disparities account for re ethnic disparities in the recipients of organs, all kinds of stuff. So th these are really a problem, and since 1998, this has been the top priority for fixing this within the transplant community. Neither place of residence nor place of listing is supposed to be a major determinant of access to a transplant. Um, so one idea was, well, certainly the DSAs are not doing a good job of allocating livers to the sickest first. So let's just broaden the sharing. Let's, let's make sure that the liver goes to the sickest first in a larger area. Well, there already is a second tier of geography, and it's regions, so these are the 11 UNOS regions. They also are based essentially on historical relationships between transplant centers, weren't designed to any purpose other than administrative convenience. So the, the, the main idea has been within the transplant community for a long time, let's do broader sharing within these 11 geographic regions. And the fight over that lasted a very long time. And those are their arm wrestling. This is from the 1990s during the liver wars. <clears throat> when broader geographic sharing for livers was proposed, the hospitals that would have lost money, prestige, standing in the community by doing fewer liver transplants reacted very badly and brought in lobbyists to try to pass legislation in their state houses. They passed laws saying organs can never leave my state for transplantation. They went to Congress and got some laws passed saying UNOS isn't allowed to change the allocation of organs without Congress saying it's okay. There were also, you know, there's a lot of um, public media attention to this and the debate turned into really about transplant centers fighting over who wins and who loses in this battle, and that, that's really too bad. But um, it turns out that the, the solution they were fighting over, we discovered, wouldn't have solved the problem at all. In fact, it makes this, the problem worse. Strangely enough, the 11 regions that we have are so badly drawn for the purpose of sharing organs to make them available to the sickest person that they would with fully regional sharing, you'd be in a worse situation because you'd have some areas that are within a region with one donor service area that's so off balance, now you drag everyone down with you and there's no source within that district for the livers that you actually need. So we showed pretty recently that uh, fully regional sharing wouldn't even have reduced geographic disparity in transplant and that actually the solution was something 
something different, which is that we needed to design the district map so that it actually reflected that balance of need and supply. So we're going to use integer programming to design geographic boundaries that partition the country into districts that actually make sharing more fair. So this is a, an old classic problem within operations research. And we're going to use optimization to design the districts. I used OPL CPLEX to run the code. And then we analyze it using this other program called the liver simulated allocation model. So I'll get to both of those. But Uh, what we, what, so what we're going to do is take the DSAs, leave the DSA boundaries, but just group them differently into districts. And our redistricting objective was make this system as fair as it can be, minimizing misdirected livers, where we define that livers misdirected if it goes to a different, if it's link, linked in a different district than where it would have gone if you had let the organs go to any patient highest meld in the country. Well, why can't you just have one national list and get it to the highest meld person anywhere in the country, the livers really do have to be transplanted very urgently after they're retrieved within six to eight hours. And plus the back table operating, there really isn't time to send it cross country. So that, that kind of solution wouldn't work. So that's why we have constraints that say, well, what, does, what is a feasible district? So we worked with the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network has a liver committee that's in charge of liver transplant policy. We were iterating with them these models. We'd, we'd show them a map, and they'd say, well, I don't like that map because of this. One good example of that was we, they had asked us to design somewhere between four and eight districts, and they were looking at different metrics. And then I, I put up a map. I said, well, this is the optimal map according to the constraints you designed. And they said, that's no good. Well, why is that no good? Well, look at that district. I know there are only three transplant centers in one of these districts. And the problem is, if you don't have very many transplant centers competing for the same supply of livers, then they tend to reject anything that's not a perfect, young, very, very healthy donor. So it, it causes underutilization of livers if there's not enough transplant centers in one place. So we kind of went back and forth with them to decide what were the right model constraints. So this is about the integer programming model. These two yellow variables at the top, essentially to solve the integer programming model is going to be to decide whether WIK should be 1 or should be 0, and whether YIK should be 1 or should be 0, which is deciding what groups I'm going to place these districts into. And the data I start with are really, really simple. Just the number of liver transplant centers, the number of donors, and the number of donors. This one is the number of donors that would have gone to that area if you hadn't had any geographic constraints. And then I need to know how far away are the districts and how long does it take to transport a thing. We actually had a really complex transport model here where we did Google driving directions. And then if it flies, you have to drive to the nearest airport. You have to fly. You have to find all of those things. <clears throat> but um, we, so we were minimizing this sum. This thing is how many livers would have gone to an area under pro, under no geography distribution. And this is the number of livers that are available under a particular district map in the Kth district. And so that says basically how many livers are misdirected in the Kth district. And we add that up over all the districts. So minimize how many livers are going to the wrong place. And that the constraints, this is really straightforward. We wanted it to be understandable to everyone who was making, who was part of making this decision. Um, the each DSA gets assigned to exactly one district K, and the YKs say whether a particular district is nominated as the center of that. Uh, a particular DSA is nominated as the center of that district. So the YKs are just there to help me count up number of districts and whether I've got the minimum number of six transplant centers per district. And this says that I can't have transport time be too long. And this says, this one is actually the most complicated one. This says that I want every DSA to be assigned to the district center closest to it. It's basically a compactness constraint for the districts. And so we have these alphas which say, 
is I closer to the, dis the center of district K than J is. So if J is a center and K is a center, then I want A to go, I to go to the closest center. So here are the districts we designed, eight districts, four districts. These are the two proposals that were put out for comment. Uh, the thing about that is that the integer program is really, really simplified. People get sicker, they get better, so melds change over time. Also, a lot of times people drop off the list if they get too sick, so I'm assuming that everyone is all gonna be there for all time. I'm assuming that everyone says yes when they're offered a liver, but in fact, a lot of livers are turned down. And there's a lot of work right now that I'm doing to improve modeling of how we, how we understand why offers are turned down. Um, inside the liver simulated allocation model. So the liver simulated allocation model is absolutely necessary for introducing all of this clinical detail that could convince a physician audience that this was a reasonable plan. So we took the, we used the liver simulated allocation model to sort of test our redistricting plans. This means we have a, a stream of patient arrivals, a stream of organ arrivals. This is a discrete event simulation. While people are waiting on the waiting list, they get sicker, they get better, sometimes they get so sick they can't have a transplant and they get taken off the waiting list. The liver allocation rules can be changed, so we're saying what if the liver allocation rules had been according to four districts or eight districts instead of our 11 regions. Every time an organ arrives, we decide who is at the top of the list, and they are offered the organ. Sometimes they accept, sometimes they decline. If they take the liver, then there is a module that figures out how well they would have done with that liver. And sometimes the liver fails, they go back on the list. So all of this clinical detail is captured here, a lot more that I'm not showing you their diagnosis and other lab values that we're sim simulating. And only the simulation was able to convince sort of the transplant community that we would really be reducing the difference in MELD at which people get transplanted across the country. People in California are waiting until MELDs of 36, 38, where they're really close to death before they can get a transplant. People are getting transplanted at MELDs of 24 in Tennessee, in Florida, places where there just happens to be a much larger supply and less need. So, you can see that even if we had a fully national system, there would still be, this is almost like noise, almost like unavoidable friction in the system. And four or eight districts gets very close to sort of the, as close as we can get to fair compared with the local and regional systems. In other words, this is what we're doing now. This is what people thought would fix the problem but doesn't fix the problem at all. We would also be saving lives because getting the liver to the sickest person first saves their lives. And so we'd save maybe 600 lives with a four district system, uh, three or 400 with a, an eight district system. And this is another way to look at this disparity uh, in MELD and how it got resolved. So this is showing places where the meld at transplant is very, very high or very low. Those are all red if the transplant meld is really high. Those are places where you don't want to live if you need a liver transplant, California and the Northeast. And places where the meld at transplant is very low are the light pink. So this is where you can move to if you need a liver transplant these days. It turns out that regional sharing doesn't make this better. It kind of makes it worse. But if we had these redistricted plans, we would make almost all of the parts of the country blue. It's kind of curious that California stays red, even with four district plan. It turns out that the geographic uh, unfortunateness of California is that they are an isolated island of lots and lots of liver disease with very few donors anywhere near them. And so turns out that even the best plan, if you can't do national sharing, it's very difficult to solve this problem for California. But the problem has actually gotten better even though, even though it still looks red. Uh, we, we use this to give details to the community about how many Organs will have to fly. They're talking about cost being a very important consideration. It turns out that even though it really does cost a lot to hire a lot of private planes to move the livers from one place to another so that they can be transplanted into the very sickest person, 
we would save a ton of money on taking care of super sick people who right now suck up a lot of resources in the ICU while they're waiting for their liver transplants. So this is even cost saving, unlike what people assumed that it would be at first. And this plan has gotten the farthest of any fix to geographic unfairness since the, since the whole struggle began, maybe almost 15 years ago. This is a quote from David Mulligan. We got a unanimous vote in the OPTN liver committee, even though there were people there who knew their hospitals would be doing fewer transplants, would sort of be the losers. But so why did this happen? I really think this happened because we were using this computational optimization model that said, what you're voting for right now is, should we be fair? in the allocation of livers. Rather than saying, should we, well, should we do plan A or should we do plan B or should we do plan C? Essentially, everything up to that point had been just ad hoc uh, ideas about how we should fix geographic allocation. And everyone could always say, well, you invented that because that's your pet idea. You invented that because that's your pet idea. And the, so using optimization allowed everyone to vote instead on the idea of, should we actually be sending the liver to the sickest person or not? And it was really hard for people to vote against that. Now, that doesn't mean that the fight is over. There actually is ongoing, a big battle. So this was the most highly attended public forum in UNOS history. It organized entirely to discuss this redistricting model. In September 2014, they held another one in June 2015. And the, 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 the threats and tension are escalating. But actually, we do have pretty high hopes that this will be passed into policy soon. I wish I had a little bit better end, end point than that, but it might take another year or so for the legal and policy wrangling to shake out. But essentially what I'm doing here is I'm trying to build a transparent optimization model that everyone in the room can understand. There were lots of iterations of this model along the way that had uh, garbled parameters, and I would try to explain them to my colleagues on the transplant world, and they would say, what is that beta for? I'd say, well, that's the trade-off between, and no, that's, that's not okay. Every number that actually ended up going into the redistricting model had a unit and was a number that someone could go out into the literature and measure. So we build these transparent optimization models, and we tell the transplant community, you're not actually voting on this redistricting plan. You're actually voting on, should we make a plan that distributes livers more fairly. And so it ends this endless cycle of, well, let's try this. And then we test it. And they say, well, that was pretty good, but let's try this. And we test it. Well, that's pretty good. Instead, we say, what's the goal? Here's the best policy. Whether they implement it or not actually is, is kind of out of our hands. Um, I'm on the scientific registry for transplant recipients. And that's our role, is to support the policymakers with this kind of analysis. But we try to make things as simple as they have to be to use an integer program. And then we use simulation to bring in enough detail that they make sense to clinicians. So following this kind of idea, I'll tell you about another problem that I worked on. This um, is the problem that distracted me from finishing my thesis, because it came up right at, the, right at the end as I was finishing my thesis on something else entirely. My husband came to me with this amazing problem, and we realized it was essential to rush it into publication. So the only person who was unhappy about this was my advisor, but everyone else was really excited about, about paired donation. So the idea of paired donation or kidney exchange is that a lot of people want to be living donors of kidneys for their loved ones, for their friends. This operation has gotten a lot easier because it can now be done laparoscopically. The recovery time isn't bad. The risk to the donor is very minimal. So a lot of people are willing to be donors. However, about a third of the time, you find out that the donor cannot donate to the recipient they wanted to donate to because they either have the wrong blood type or they have some other HLA antigen that the recipient would be allergic to, so that would cause them to reject the kidney. Uh, however, you can really just circumvent this entire problem if you can find another pair, and the donor in gray wanted to give to the recipient in gray, but instead the donor in gray turns out to be compatible with the recipient in blue, so these two exchange kidneys for a completely compatible transplant. 
So this has the potential to greatly increase the number of people who are able to be live donors. And I represent all of this information in a graph and have a node. And inside each node is both a donor and the recipient that they wanted to donate to, but they couldn't. And then I draw an edge between two of these if an exchange is possible between these two pairs. So this O blood type donor can give to an O blood type recipient. And this A blood type donor can give to this A blood type recipient. Now, normally, an O donor could give to an A recipient, but they have some other kind of cross-match incompatibility. All right, so now I've got uh, all of these nodes and edges. What we're solving here is a maximum matching problem, which are the edges I should select so I can pick a, as large as possible a set that no two edges touch the same nodes. So here, obviously, if pair two and pair three get hooked up early, then pair one and pair four don't find anyone that they could exchange with. And it, it's a little more difficult at least to a physician audience when I show them this graph and say, okay, well, we're gonna solve a maximum matching problem. Try to select as many uh, transplants as possible. Non-optimal matching. If I don't do anything very smart, I might only get 10 out of these, out of these 40 transplanted. But using maximum cardinality matching, which again is an old algorithm applied to this new problem, I can get 14 out of the 40 transplanted. But of course, I, it's a little more complicated. I want to prioritize children who are recipients. They're already prioritized in the deceased donor model. I want to maybe prioritize a zero mismatch if it's a particularly good match between this donor and this recipient, then that means the kidney might live twice as long once that recipient gets it. So I want to prioritize those. Importantly, that means that the, the points have to go on the edges and not on the nodes. Weirdly, if I put the points all on the nodes, if I, if I prioritize this node because it's a child and this node because um, it's a person who's been waiting for a very long time, then I have a problem whose maximum weight solution is always also a maximum cardinality solution. In other words, I can prioritize people, I can prioritize nodes over other nodes, and never do fewer transplants than I would have been able to in the best case. But if I put weights on the edges, I can, I can inadvertently put a too high a weight on this edge and create a situation where I wouldn't get 14 transplanted. So I, I might actually decrease the number transplanted in exchange for this prioritization. So some of the theoretical results we've been working on are guarantees about the ways that you can set edge weights so that you make sure you don't give up any in the total number of transplants that you do. And you're still able to prioritize what you need to be able to prioritize, which is not just this donor and recipient, but the matching between the two exchange partners. Okay, and then, well, this is how they were doing it before I got involved. This is the Hopkins kidney pair donation match board. They had the blood types, and they were saying, okay, this, can this person go here? Can this person go here? And this is uh, the nurse coordinator, Janet Hiller, and one of the printouts from some of the early spreadsheet-based versions of the software they were using to do this match. So, so using Edmund's algorithm was a big advance. Um, and... I was just talking about this result, the idea that if we're careful about the way we set the weights, we'll still get 14 people transplanted and we'll get a higher, as high a weight as possible, and as many points as possible, so we're prioritizing the right people. Well, it turns out that when physicians were looking at this problem before we wrote our paper that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association, they often used an edge rank heuristic which is really bad for this problem because if I say, let's take the very best possible donation out of all of the edges in this graph, then I might choose this 120 point edge. Even though there's another matching, this matching gets 200 points. 
if you ignore the connection structure of the graph and you just think, let's just take the best edge and then the next best edge and the next best edge, then bad things happen. I know at of at least one case where this exact situation happened in a real exchange um, that was being run in Ohio, I think, and um, a not very savvy computer program put the together that this was the optimal match. And luckily, the physicians involved found it because I think these two patients were at one hospital or something like that. Maybe three of them were at one of the hospitals, but when they were on the phone discussing the, the match between those two, they kind of said, well, wait, didn't you have a pair that was like this? And didn't you have a pair that was like this? And they found it at the last minute and were able to get four people transplanted instead of two. But we don't know how many times that might have happened before people started using better algorithms to do pair donation match. But it turns out, actually, that all of this time I was writing papers about pair donation, it was illegal. Why was pair donation illegal? Well, because the National Organ Transplantation Act said that no one can donate an organ for valuable consideration. So you can't give someone an organ so that they'll give you a job or a house or be your girlfriend. But <laughs> is giving someone an A blood type kidney with the agreement that, yes, they will give you this other B blood type kidney. Is that an exchange of valuable objects? Well, actually, it was. And so there was a moment when um, they had done a very exciting five-way exchange, or maybe it was a seven-way exchange, at Johns Hopkins, all at Johns Hopkins. And they had to do it on the weekend because they had to have like five or seven ORs working all at the same time, all the transplant surgeons, a full nursing team. After it was finished, they held a press conference. And Bob Montgomery, who's, who's my, door, uh, my husband, Dory's boss, said, by the way, everything we've done is illegal. So I would like to invite the government to prosecute me for this. So, <laughs> It was kind of an oversight in the way that the law was written, but no one was really that excited about fixing it because in the early days, people thought that pair donation wouldn't apply to very many patients. It was thought of only in the sense of if you have an AB pair and the other pair is BA, and they didn't consider other cases, and they said, well, this is only like 1% or 2% of transplants. It's not really that helpful to do pair donation, even though it had been proposed in the 80s. So we went back to simulation. So we didn't know who was out there who had an incompatible donor, because usually if you had come to a doctor and said, here's my donor, they're the wrong blood type, the doctor would send you home and say, I'm sorry, they can't donate. And in fact, probably a lot of donors were like ruled out at the kitchen table. They never even presented to a physician, and no one was writing down this information. So we invented a virtual patient and their whole network of people who might potentially be wanting to donate to them. And we had to include both blood type and HLA, human leukocyte antigen, inheritance, because a lot of your potential donors are probably relatives of yours. So you have all of the people in purple are sort of population average alleles here, and then you inherit your blood type alleles. Also, there's more here. There's more details about HLA types that get inherited. And so these people might also potentially be your donors. And we didn't know how many people were out there who might have had an incompatible donor. So what we did is we generated a bunch of virtual families with all of the donors who might have been able to donate to that candidate and did a virtual cross-match test and medical workup. Sometimes all of their donors were ruled out, so they had no donor. If their donor was compatible with them, then they probably donated directly, but if their donor, they had a, vi a viable donor, but they weren't compatible, then we held them in this bucket of virtual incompatible donor and recipient pairs. So what we did is we just kept generating new families of candidates and donors until the number of people in this bucket reached the number of actual direct donations from last year. And when that many families had come in the top of this, there were somewhere between 2,500 and 4,500 pairs, incompatible pairs, available every year. And this is way larger than anyone had expected. We showed that at least half of them were going to match for paired donation with more sophisticated um, desensitization programs and also incorporating into the matches compatible pairs 
who could have done a direct donation, but they just join an exchange because they want to help someone else who's lost out on this opportunity, then maybe closer to 80% of these people can match for a paired donation. This is also cost saving because it turns out dialysis is one of the most expensive medical interventions that Medicare provides. If you need dialysis, then you qualify for Medicare. This happened in the 1970s. So that means Medicare pays for every single person with end stage renal failure to have an, somewhere between 80000 80, to $100,000 a year just for dialysis. And doing a kidney transplant then saves the government about a half a million dollars every single time you can do a kidney transplant. And so that means that if you multiply that over everyone who can get a kidney transplant, this is a really money saving for the government. And we have seen, since this was implemented, the largest increment in living kidney donation that has ever happened. So, Paired donation really made a huge difference, and no one knew that, that, it would, that it would until we created the simulation. And those simulation results helped us to convince Congress that they really ought to act to change the law. So they implemented this Charlie Norwood Act, making paired donation explicitly legal, essentially on the strength of these simulation results. The actual increases in paired donation, when I'm talking about this 20% increase in living kidney donation, that didn't happen until later, after it was ramped up, maybe 10 years later. But we, we sort of felt like we were Nostradamus in a sense, because lots of the later developments within kidney paired donation, we had predicted based on our simulation. You know, We predicted there will be a buildup of pairs who are very hard to match, and so now you'll, you'll see the match rates start to slow down. I mean, there's a lot more to do here algorithmically. It's still a really interesting problem in the sense that um, I kind of lied when I said that you have this situation, because that would say that I had 40 people sign up on the same day. You, it's really not a static problem where you know everyone out there who has an incompatible donor. It's really a dynamic problem. Next week, another pair will arrive, and next week, another pair will arrive. So there's a lot of active work right now in online matching algorithms for this. Could we match some people right away, but, but maybe hold a few people in reserve, because they're going to be the key person to make a much better match a little while later as someone else arrives? So online algorithms, there's also lots of three-way, four-way algorithms here where you're looking for cycles within the graph. And there's exciting work there. Um, it turns out that if you match, if you look for maximum cycles and the cycles can't be too big, it changes from a very nice, easy polynomial polynomial times problem into a nasty one. If you are allowed to have cycles of length three and length four, but you're not allowed to have cycles of length five or larger, then you get a nasty problem. If you can have infinite length cycles, then you're back to an easy problem. So just the realistic problem is the one that's hard to solve. And right now, the best algorithms are just about maxing out on the size of the national pair donation registry that the OPTN started in response to um, this work and after the Norwood Act was passed. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators at the SRTR and within Dori Segev's research group at Hopkins, especially people who worked on this a lot, Alan Massey and Eric Chow. <laughs>